morning, everybody. We're gonna get started. I appreciate you braving the uh, subarctic temperatures and end of days roads and all that stuff. I tell you, these the, the weather predictions are kind of like the uh, markets. You know, they tell you everything's gonna end. It never really comes to pass. So, anyway, I'd like to thank you all for coming out. Um, we have a full morning for you, but a lot of really good information that we're going to present. We're going to do kind of a cybersecurity update, talk about what Raymond James is doing to protect your information, but also what you can do to protect yourself, some of the more general threats. We're going to talk about the new tax act, how it may impact you and what the implications are. We're going to touch base on some of the other resources from Raymond James Bank. Uh, we're going to go through our process, and then we're going to give you our outlook. So, full morning. Uh, I appreciate you coming out. Joining me from the office today, uh, advisor-wise, we have Mark, Nick, Gail, Raj, Joe, the newest addition to our team. I also have Nancy, Bobby, Darlene, who helped really coordinate all of this. Roseanne, Ali, Sarah, Andrea, and Marge. And then back in the office, we've got Tracy and DeJane. So, full crew. And then to my my left, your right, uh, we've got the two gentlemen from Raymond James, Jason and Dino, and they'll be speaking uh, momentarily. So, first of all, uh, you should all have our annual report. You're the first ones to see this, the green booklet. In there is some background on the team and what's happened this year. One of the things that, that we want to do is kind of look at what's happened, but more importantly, look forward. But it's been a really good year. And what I would tell you is the same thing we've said for 30 years, that the only constant is change. It's, it's inevitable, and hopefully we can update you on what's happening and some of the opportunities. But regardless of what happens, our team is here for you, and, and we do have a full team. It's also been a great year of recognitions uh, for, from publications ranging from the Wall Street Journal to Barron's to Registered Rep, uh, and, and we appreciate that because it wouldn't be possible without all of you folks being our clients and our friends. Our goal is to help you maintain and enhance your life. That's it. We're not an investment firm, you know, as, as you've heard me say, we're a vision planning firm. And what we want to do is create an amazing experience whenever you interact with our team. And part of that's getting feedback from you about what's important, what you're worried about, and what we can do better. What I would suggest is there are a number of reasons that we're different than a lot of other companies uh, in what we do and how we do it. And I think that's important to touch on today uh, so you can understand where we're coming from and what the implications may be in the coming year. The biggest difference, and I have already said it about four times, is we're a team. It's not one individual. So when you work with an advisor, uh, you're really working with everybody. And you can contact anybody. If you need to come in or speak with someone, you can speak to any of the advisors. We do have a succession plan. Our goal is to be here for generations to come, and that's why when you look at some of the new folks we're bringing in, on the last year we hired Raj, and we just hired Joe, the idea is to bring in people that are experienced, are qualified, but also are a lot younger than I am, and Mark and Nick and Gail. I know it's hard to believe, isn't it? The other things really haven't changed in that we have no proprietary products. There's nothing that we work with that's limited to us. So we have access to the whole world of investments, and anything is totally portable. We work on a fee basis predominantly, not commissions. It's a flat fee based on assets. Now that's a change that we made about five or six years ago, and we'll get to touch on, uh, that you're going to hear more about with some of the regulations that are changing. We have a great relationship with a national really an international firm. And when I went independent in 1990, I wanted to seek a partner that could provide services beyond what we could do locally. And that's why we partnered with Raymond James. 
So you have access to a trust company, a bank, cybersecurity, investment banking, research, all types of things. But we are totally independent. So we can do what we think is best. We're not beholden to anybody. And there's certainly not a conflict of interest. And then finally, because we do manage a large amount of money, about $1.4 billion, uh, th there's scale to what we do. You know, it's not that we have to do something for today. We're, we're going to be here for the future because we're established. And um, we do have the resources to do what needs to be done. Now, one of the things that we are committed to is building social capital as well as monetary capital. And again, the vision for the firm has always been to make people's lives better, whether it's our team, our clients, or our community. One of the things we started doing in 2013 was a new initiative called Carver Cares. And I'd encourage you to look in the annual reports at some of the other philanthropic things that you all support. I mean, it's because of you that we can do these things. But Carver Cares was started to raise awareness about local nonprofits and also to help support them monetarily. But the awareness is important because we have a number of nonprofits in Lake County that benefit all of us that a lot of people aren't aware of. So today's nonprofit is Royal Family Kids. Joining us from the organization is Nick Corus and Francisco. They're here someplace. They are back. And they, they will be around later if you have questions. They're a Lake County organization that's dedicated to the needs of local Lake and Geauga County foster children. The focus is to give foster kids between the ages of 6 and 12 a life-changing experience through one week at summer camp and to provide positive relationships throughout the rest of the school year that they might not otherwise have. The camp is staffed entirely by volunteers. In fact, I know some of our clients um, work at the camp. And they go through intensive training, including you know, studying the dynamics of child abuse and neglect and using professionals to help support the kids. The volunteers donated a minimum um, you know, the, the week in the summer plus their training time. Financial contributions are paid, are used to pay for uh, facilities, meals, clothing, transportation, and frankly, some of these kids really have nothing. So to provide, uh, you know, a wardrobe, a toothbrush, just basic things that we take for granted. Their mission is to provide life-changing moments for children of abuse that are in the foster care system, and to treat people royally, to keep moving forward, and make moments uh, that matter. What they need, obviously, is support um, from volunteers and then also any financial donations. And their hope is that every camper leaves camp full of positive memories and feeling treated specially, treated royally. So I hope you take a look at it. Uh, it's, again, one of those under-the-radar organizations that people may not be aware of that are really making a difference in our community. So. There's information on the tables, and Nick and Francisco will be here if you have questions. Our process, I think this is very important to understand how we're working, because it dictates a lot of what we do and what you see. We have three core beliefs, and the first one is it's not how much you make that's important, it's how much you keep net of fees, expenses, and taxes. We're not seeking to beat some index. We're not trying to beat the S&P or beat this or that. What we're trying to do is make sure that you can meet your goals, your objectives, and do it in a way that you can still you know, have some peace of mind, meeting your risk tolerance. So number one is, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. Number two is we invest not just for growth, but for income. Income is very important. And those of you who have done reviews lately, when we look going backwards, and we've looked at the, the chart that says, hey, here's how I've made my money, it's surprising that a lot of its income is not necessarily growth. And finally, we don't believe you can time the markets, nor do we believe you need to. We believe you need to proactively rebalance based upon your stated allocation. And a lot of times that means getting out of what's doing well into what's doing poorly, which is a little different because we're not buying stocks, we're buying 
typically exchange traded funds and mutual funds. And so if you look, it's very interesting that historically, a lot of times what the worst performing thing one year is, is the best the next year. And so what we want to do is continue to rebalance, take some chips off the table, um, so we're not overweighted any place. Now the process is something, and we actually have a trade name registration on this, called Personal Vision Planning. Because that's what it is, it's based on you. It's a holistic approach that doesn't just look at the investments, it looks at your tax situation, your estate planning, your asset protection. What are you trying to do for your heirs? And take all of that and come up with a plan. The other thing is, this changes. You know, it's not a, a static process, it's dynamic. And that's why reviews are so important when we call you, A, to understand what you, you need and want, but also so we can understand what's changing and make the updates based on that, not based on what the market's doing. There are three reasons we're gonna make a change to the portfolio. And between regular meetings, we'll call you if we feel something should be changed. And we'd encourage you to contact us if you have a question or something changes with you. But number one is something changes with you. All of a sudden you've decided to purchase a house or do a trip or you need money for something or downsize. The second is to rebalance because typically something's done very, very well and we have too much money there. And the third one is there's an issue with an investment. <clears throat> a fund manager changes or there, there's something that's not right that we need to look at. The science is really picking the investments. The art is making sure that it meets your goals. And again, that's why sitting down with you during the reviews is important, but also there's a lot of stuff going on between reviews. And as I say, the way that we do this, you know, when you look around at the number of people that we work with, although we do limit the number of clients we're taking on, is because we have a very skilled team. You know, it's about 200 years of combined experience with the people in the office. Um, the other thing we would tell you, besides the fact that this gives some contingency planning, if something happens to anyone, including myself, the firm is going to be there to serve you and your family. And the business has contingency plans, both for the physical building, but also our data, and, and again, the people. But it also means that you can get service when you need it and understand who to speak to. You know, what I would encourage you is if you need distributions or something administrative, you don't need to speak to, to one of the advisors necessarily. Any of our service professionals can help you. And in fact, if you ask us to do it, we're probably going to ask them to do it because we don't know how to do it. Um, for the most part, our associates are registered. They, they have their Series 7 investment licenses. They are registered as advisors. Um, but I encourage you, if you need things like that, you can reach out to them. And conversely, you may get a call from someone other than the person you normally meet with. That's because we want to contact you. Um, and again, as a team, it shouldn't really make, make a difference. So behind the scenes, there's a very proactive approach. We don't believe in buy and hold. We think you need to be uh, reallocating. This helps move from luck, you know, or market timing to science, and carefully rebalancing based on your needs and the prevailing conditions. Because there are changes, and we'll touch on the Tax Reform Act in a minute. We do electronically monitor all holdings all the time. It's not that we have to physically look at your stuff every day. But the reality is that allocation accounts for about 90% of return. What you pick really is less than 6% statistically. And so that's really what, what we want to focus on. But be assured, even if we're not phoning you constantly, you know, we are monitoring the investments, as is Raymond James, which is where the statements come from. So, any questions on the process for you? get into some politics, because that's always fun. <laughs> Interesting couple years. I mean, as far as the election, the news, all that kind of stuff. And we've said this before, but I think it's truer today that any time we've said it, 
that you've got to look at what's happening, not what's being said. Forget what the media is saying. Forget what the politicians are saying. Watch what's happening. Because that's going to tell you where we're going. That's going to tell you what you can expect. How many of you guys drove here today? Okay. When you hit the red lights, what did you do? Yeah. When you hit the green lights, what did you do? Yeah. When you went to the green lights, did you stop and just check to make sure? No. It's signaled to go. That's what happens with political policy and with the markets. There's signals. And people follow them. That they, there are signals to stop and there are signals to go. And right now, we got green lights all the way. They're cutting regulations. They've cut taxes. They're, they're, there's amazing things happening economically, regardless of what you think politically or socially. And that's why the market hit 70 records last year. And we constantly, we're, we're going to close it on 26,000 on the town the next week or so. Um, that's a green light. And, and it's, it's, in our opinion, we're going to talk about it in a minute, it's not going to stop. There'll be bumps. And you'll get a few red lights along the way. But you've got to look at what's happening, not what's being said. Because if you listen to what's being said, I mean, we're going to hell in a handbasket, uh, as is the world. So one of the things we want to do is try to cut through some of the noise. Now, the biggest thing last year was this new DOL rule. Department of Labor fiduciary rule. Um, and it did have some impact. This rule was to go into effect April of this year. And it made a lot of sense. It basically said that going forward, advisors had to do what's in your best interest. And you'd think, well, they have to do that. No, they don't. The standard has been, for brokerage firms, a suitability standard. They don't have to do what's best for you. They have to do what's suitable. They can do what's best for them. Registered investment advisors have to do what's best for you. We have been a registered investment advisor since 1991. So besides the fact that it's morally right and the fact that it's good business because people refer their friends and they're happy, we are legally obligated to do what's best as a fiduciary. But most brokerage firms are not. It's kind of like going to the doctor and you can get the prescription drug that's $1,000 a month or the exact same generic for $10, and he writes you and says, DAW, dispense is written, you must take the prescription. <laughs> same drug. And then you find out he's getting kicked back 50 bucks from Pfizer on every script he writes. Well, there's a conflict of interest there. It's still suitable because it's the same drug. That's what happens with a lot of investments where a firm says, we can sell our own stuff. It's the same as the less expensive, but it's still suitable. The DOL rule said you can't do that for IRAs. It didn't say anything about non-IRAs. In April, the rule passed. It was supposed to go into effect January of this year. A lot of firms started to move this way. And then the, the current administration said, let's wait, push it back to 2019, or just, just not do it. I think what you're going to see is more of a universal fiduciary standard, which says... All accounts will have to be under that standard, which is a good thing. And you're going to hear more about it. You know, there's a lot of noise, and then it kind of went away. But this is one of the reasons we focus on fee-based investing. With a fee-based account, we are not paid on transactions. You make more money, we make more money. If you're not happy, you're going to leave, and we make nothing. So we have an incentive to keep you happy. But it puts us on the same side of the table. If we contact you for a transaction, it's because we believe it's best for you. Moreover, you know exactly what you're paying. You know, commission-based, because it's often buried in the investments, you don't. And in a lot of cases, because it allows us to buy things like exchange-traded funds that have lower internal expenses, it's actually less expensive. But we've made a concerted effort to do this. I think you're going to continue to see the industry move in this direction, because it is one of the things the Department of Labor is pushing. Any questions on that? Okay. New tax plan. This just passed. It's pretty interesting. Originally they wanted to simplify to three tax brackets. We've still got seven. The top bracket was reduced to 37% because 
you've got to be making over six hundred thousand dollars as a couple to hit that. So it's a pretty high threshold. The other thing they did, which is really good for higher income people, is the phase out of itemized deduction goes away. It used to be once you made over a certain amount, you start to lose your itemized deductions. Now you can keep 100% of your deductions. What they did change, though, is state and local taxes are capped at $10,000. So a lot of people who itemize could write off real estate tax, state income tax. That's now capped. So I heard all the squawking from people in California, New Jersey, and other real high tax states. Mortgage interest um, is deductible on up to $750,000 of debt. You hear a lot in the press that you can no longer write off your mortgage. You can still write off your mortgage um, as long as it's under $750,000, which is a pretty big mortgage. Home equity lines of credit you can no longer deduct. And they're not grandfathered. So if you do have a home equity line, that is not deductible. But the fact is they raised the standard deduction to $24,000. So a lot of people aren't going to itemize anyway. And this is going to save a lot of lower income and middle income people a lot of money. Forget the noise. This tax act is great for middle income Americans, both directly and indirectly. Because the reality is if you make $77,000 or less, you now pay no income tax. That's a pretty good deal, federally. They expanded what you could do with 529 plans. Those are those college savings plans. You can now use them for K through 12. Before it was just for college. So if you have kids or grandkids going to a private school, you can use it for that. You can't use it for homeschooling. That was a big fight. Uh, Roth conversions, you can still convert from an IRA to a Roth, but you cannot reverse it. It used to be you converted you had to October of the year following to put it back. You cannot put it back now. And finally, the qualified charitable distributions. This is a really great thing. If you're philanthropically inclined and you're over 70 and a half, and you have to make required distributions, you can make them directly to a charity and you pay no tax on it at all. Up to $100,000 a year. But the QCDs were, were retained uh, as far as that goes. Now one thing that's interesting, the capital gains rules are basically the same, but in how they define them is different. And by that it used to be capital gains are tied to your tax bracket. Because the tax brackets were lowered, they've changed it um, to be based on income. So before, the 0, 15, and 20% rates uh, for capital gains and dividends were basically for specific tax brackets. Now it's based on income. So if you have, you're married and you file jointly, and your income is 77200 or less, you pay zero tax on capital gains. If you're single, it's 38600 The 15% tax bracket applies for people making between $77,000 and $479,000. And the 20% bracket's if you make over $479,000. And the reality is if you're making over $479,000, 20% of capital gains is still a gift. But the reality is a lot of people aren't going to pay taxes on capital gains. The big one for the economy is the corporate tax. Now, again, all the noise was about cutting the 35% rate down for big companies. That's not the story. Big companies don't pay any tax anyway. Apple and GE have never paid taxes in the last few years. In fact, they get tax credits because they keep all their money overseas. The big story is on smaller and medium-sized businesses. So basically, they lowered the corporate tax rate to 21%. They got rid of the alternative minimum tax. How many of you got caught on that one? AMT? Yeah, AMT's gone. And if you repatriate funds, money that's overseas, they're going to pay 15.5% on cash and only 8% on uh, future profits with eight years to pay. So the idea is a lot of money is going to come back 
into the United States because of this. The other thing is for capital expenditures, um, they can write off over a five-year period. And for small businesses, which, which is most of America, for cap, when they invest, they can now write off no depreciation, just write off up to a million bucks a year. That's huge. It is huge. It's huge. You talk about putting fuel on the fire. Um, so companies are investing. And, and if, you know, if you look at what they're doing with it, again, as far as bonuses and pay raises, it's only been two weeks. Um, AT&T, Alaska Airlines, America Airlines, Bank of America, BBT, Comcast, Fifth Third Bank, JetBlue, Nationwide, PNC, Sinclair Broadcast, Southwest Air, Travelers, U.S. Bank, and Walmart are all giving their employees a thousand to two thousand buck bonuses. Again, the media says, "Oh, it's only a thousand dollars." That's a lot of money, especially if you're you're making, you know, minimum wage. That's that's a huge bump uh, for you. Additionally, a bunch of companies have already announced raises from nine to ten dollars an hour up to $15 an hour. BBT, Walmart, and a few have already raised just in the last two weeks. So that money's gonna come in to the economy. Um, so I, I think, and we're gonna touch on this, the last thing I wanna speak about in a second. I think one of the problems when we're planning and we're looking at some of this is recency bias. We think about the things that happened most recently. You know, if I ask you what you had for lunch every day in the last week, most people are going to say, well, yesterday I had this, and then the day before I had that. They go backwards. They don't go the other way, because it's hard to remember. When we're planning, we've got to look beyond the recent, because things change. And from a broad standpoint, it's important to understand, we're not our parents. In our parents, the goal was to work till 65, and they died at 67 or 68, maybe 70. Now people retire at 55, and they never die. You know, I mean, it's amazing. Um, so the risk is, you know, outliving our money, keeping up with inflation. Now, we're going to talk about this because the flip side to all this growth is you do see higher inflation. You got all this money chasing stuff, prices are going to go up, whether it's groceries or movie tickets or airline tickets or fast food, whatever it is, prices are moving up. And again, the media is going to talk, oh my God, we have inflation. Well, yeah, we also have a market and economy that's, that's cranking away. So you've got to look at both sides. And I'm not saying everybody's going to be better off. You know, to me, this is a lot like 1982 when, when they cut the top rate. It, the difference was we had very high unemployment at the time, north of 11%. And you could go to the bank and get a 10% CD. Today, you can't do that. So this money, in our opinion, a lot of it's going to go into the markets which is why the market's going up. There's nowhere else to invest. But you also see higher inflation. And so um, you've got to look at both, both sides. So very quickly to wrap up, what, what do we see? And again, we don't have a crystal ball, nor with our process does it matter. There's always going to be the unexpected. And by, by following a proactive, diversified approach, what the market or economy does, short term, doesn't really matter. What I tell you is people worry about the wrong things. You know, it's never the bus you see coming that hits you. It's the one that you don't. And so, um, you know, if you look at spending, if you look at the economy, un unemployment and underemployment are the lowest rates in 17 years, according to CNN. Um, I mean, unemployment's about 4% right now. It's as low as it's been since 2000. We, we talked about the bonuses. Um, consumers are spending more and more and more. On the um, Black Friday and then the Cyber Monday, they spent about six and a half billion dollars, which, which was up considerably. It's a 20% jump year to year. It's huge as far as what people are spending. So, so let me ask you, you this, because clients don't own the market, um, but generally portfolios do move kind of in the same direction. Every time the market's gone down in the last 100 years, it's come back. True or false? Yeah. And every time it's come back, it's at a new high. True or false? 
So why do people worry about it? I mean, it, it always comes back and it always does. Now the fact is, one of the things we look at very carefully is having enough cash and income to ride out those bumps. And that's why it's important that we communicate because one person's cash will be different than the other. But why don't we do better? What's because we're inundated with noise from, from magazines and TV channels and websites and all that stuff. And yeah, it's an election year again, midterm elections. And then it'll be a presidential election. I mean, it's perpetually an election year now. But the stuff they talk about is always the same. And you guys have seen some of these. I added two new ones. But it's always about the economy, the, the wealthy versus the, the non-wealthy. It's always about terrorism. It's always about Social Security entitlements. Do we cut them? Can they survive? It's always about some pandemic, you know, whether it was Ebola or bird flu or H1N1 or Zika or whatever it is, SARS. It's always about the deficit. But look at these. These, these are from the 70s and 80s. We talk about the same stuff for the last 40 years. I, I could take these covers today and be just as applicable. Because they're talking about the same dumb things. So, move beyond that. As, as Peter Lynch, I don't know, maybe you guys remember this guy, with Fidelity. Um, you know, it's really important to differentiate between market drops and affecting an investment, a problem with an investment itself versus the broader market. But as he says, far more money has been lost by investors preparing for corrections or trying to anticipate corrections than the corrections themselves. And let's take a look. We have a great article. It's called Legends of the Fall. Um, if you've come in for reviews, this is in your packets. Um, and we can send it to you as well. But if you look at the market drops, you know, one of the worst drops of 73 to 74, 21 months, we we're down 35%. Five years later, a dollar is worth a dollar 53. So you're up 53% even though it dipped. And 10 years later, the dollar that was in the market was worth 371. Now, of course, the past doesn't guarantee the future, but, but look at the other drops, 87, um, the you know, Black, Black, uh, Black Monday, yeah. you know, it dropped 24%. Now, one of the worst dips was the one we had in 2008, 2009, 57%. Um, but now, 10 years later, we're basically up, you know, about 80%. They do come back. And even if you're drawing, it's kind of interesting. This shows the blue line is the market drop 73 to 82. Someone had a million dollars, they're taking out 50,000 a year, 5%. Their million went to 543,000. Pretty scary. 10 years later, it's worth a million six even drawing. If we look at the dip in 2008, your million went to 547, today you're just over a million again. But you've been taking 50,000 a year. We will have drops. I can't tell you when or how much or why, but they really don't matter. So finally, why are we so optimistic? Huge energy reserves. We, we have more proven gas and oil now in the Middle East. 100 years worth. Corporate profits are at record levels. We're the worldwide leader in manufacturing. Foreign investment is flooding into the United States because as dysfunctional as our government may be see, seem to be, it's one of the most stable in the world. Our dollar is stable. Huge amounts of capital on the sidelines. You can't get much better with what they're doing with cutting regulations and taxes. Lowest levels of unemployment in 17 years, and one of the biggest ones is innovation. Technology is changing quickly, and it's good. There's also a risk that we're going to touch on in about two minutes. But the pace of change is phenomenal, and the United States and Israel are leading that. But you talk about capital on the sidelines. You know, Apple, if this was uh, two years ago, had $157 billion overseas. As of October of this year, they had $261 billion overseas in cash. They're going to start bringing that back. In fact, they just announced building a plant here to make the glass for the, um, the iPhones. But collectively, there's about $600 billion in cash for these companies 
that we're going to start to see coming in. Again, whether you talk about autonomous vehicles, you know, self-driving cars and trucks, you talk about virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, we're the leader in all of this stuff. And it's huge, and it is the future. The number of manufacturing jobs are coming back. And this is interesting because one of the problems they talk about with robotics is it replaces people. And it does. Um, let's see. According to the National Bureau of Economic Research, for every robot brought into the U.S., we lose about six human jobs because they can replace about six people. But what's happening right now is it's actually creating jobs. Um, and they take Carrier, for example, the plant that Trump was talking about. They were convinced to come back to the United States partially because they could save on labor by automation. They couldn't build that overseas. So they built a robotic plant, but they brought in 160 jobs to do it in the plant plus the construction. So right now, we're seeing a lot of this stuff come into the United States. Very recently, um, November 9th, China Energy signed a deal for $83 billion to invest in West Virginia. Two days ago, Fiat Chrysler said they got a billion dollars in Michigan to bring back production of the Dodge Rams, uh, which they've been producing in, in Mexico and Canada, I believe. Um, so we're seeing this money coming in because the taxes are favorable, the regulations favorable, the labor force is favorable. And the reality is the United States makes about 20% of all the stuff in the world now. China makes about 17%. But if you look at U.S. companies, we produce 30 to 40% of the world's stuff with um, about 4.5% of the population. We're very efficient. And now, a lot of that money is going to come back in the United States because of the stuff. So, the biggest challenge is inflation. Stuff's going to cost more. People are going to live longer. You've got to invest to grow your income and grow your money. Medical expenses. Still, biggest single expense in, in retirement for most people. And we can help mitigate some of that with insurance. And then the biggest thing is just making bad decisions because we get wound up due to the media and emotions. And that's where speaking to a trusted advisor can help. It's probably the biggest value the advisor adds. It's not picking investments or knowing the tax code or any of that. It's, it's trying to keep you on course with what you're trying to do. Now, as I say, we're here for you regardless of what happens. Um, we do have a big team, and that team includes everybody at Raymond James. And one of the concerns, obviously, is recently, you know, how safe is my stuff? All this technology is great, but what are the threats? How many of you guys heard about the Equifax hack? Yeah. Technology can be scary, but it's, it's kind of inevitable that that's, that's going to keep it keep happening. With that, I'd like to introduce um, Jason from Raymond James IT. Jason served as an IT uh, cybersecurity expert in the United States Air Force for eight years. Five years active duty. Yes. Five years active duty. He's been with Raymond James now three years yep. um, as, as one of the number of team. So I'd like to bring up Jason. He's going to load the presentation for me. Um, I've been in, in mentor now for about 48 hours, uh, and, and I don't I don't even think I've seen this many people in the last 48 hours in the entire town of Mentor. So uh, I'm impressed to see how many people showed up this morning, uh, given the weather. Um, I woke up this morning and, and my wife sent me a text that it was a, a chilly 68 degrees down in Tampa this morning, so she had to put on a, a light overcoat to go get her coffee this morning. Um, but we're surviving down there, I promise, and I've got a flight this afternoon to get back uh, as soon as possible. Not that o Ohio is, isn't beautiful. So uh, as Randy mentioned, uh, I am uh, a leader in the cybersecurity department at Raymond James. 
we are based out of St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, been there for about three and a half years. Prior to that, uh, I was an active duty cyber uh, operations officer, uh, which was previously a communications officer. They made it sound a little bit sexier to try to entice more people to get into that field. Um, Interestingly enough, in the Information Security Department at Raymond James, which is uh, today consists of about 120 uh, security professionals, there is a lot of former military, uh, all the way up to our Chief Information Security Officer, Andy Zulper, uh, who was a uh, former Marine. Uh, I, well, I guess you can never be a former Marine, so he is a Marine. Um, and all the way down to our analyst level, uh, uh, there are a lot of former military, Air Force, Marines, Army, uh, Navy, and that's simply because the DOD and the government agencies have been doing cybersecurity for a very long time, right? And they, they uh, save no expense on training their resources to make sure that they're really the best and the brightest. So we spend a lot of time and effort uh, recruiting those personnel that are transitioning away from uh, active duty service and try to get their first stop to be at, at Raymond James within the Information Security Department. So. Uh, very impressive team. Uh, it's growing. The budget is growing, obviously, because we're, we're fighting a tough battle. Uh, but we ensure that we stay uh, one step ahead of the game and one step ahead of the adversary. Uh, very quickly, what I'm going to go over today, the general situation. We all understand uh, the amount of cyber activity that's going on, uh, I think, and I hope that we all understand that uh, even if you're trying your damnedest not to be a player in this cybersecurity world, you are a player in the cybersecurity world, whether you like it or not. Um, I'm going to talk about the threat um, and, and what we see and hear in the news and why that's important. Uh, most importantly, probably, I'm going to go over the information security strategy of Raymond James, kind of how we uh, approach uh, this information security and cybersecurity world and, and how we're defending uh, your data and your funds and the things that you care about that you're entrusting Raymond James to uh, keep secure and keep private. Um, I'll go into some key protective measures that you actually as an individual can uh, take back and apply to your everyday lives, uh, pass that information on to your, your family and your kids uh, to make sure that you guys are doing what you need to do uh, at the end of the day to make sure that you're protecting yourselves as well. Uh, and then we'll have some Q&A. If at any point uh, there are some questions, please raise a hand, shout it out. I want this to be as back and forth as possible. I want to make sure that you guys are getting your questions answered. Um, if at some point just shout it up and I'll hear it and I'll, I'll address your question at the time. Does anybody know who this guy is? If you do, you can go back for seconds or thirds on the breakfast, uh, <laughs> breakfast bar. Anybody know who this guy is? This guy was a guy named Willie Sutton. Uh, in the, I hear some grumblings that somebody recognized him somewhere. Uh, in the world of, of American bank robbers, he's a pretty famous, pretty popular character. Uh, his uh, career, if you will, spanned, I believe, the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s even. Uh, apparently really good at his job, obviously, as a bank robber. Uh, when he was finally captured and being escorted into the courthouse in uh, New York City, a reporter there was standing on the stairs and said, Hey, Willie, why'd you rob the banks? Right? And, and he looked at the reporter and very plainly said, that's where the money was, right? So it, it's, it's no secret, right, that uh, the adversary is coming after financial services because that's where the money is, right? There's actually now uh, Sutton's law in, in the medical field that essentially says before you diagnose something, right, consider the obvious. Um, so it's obvious that the reason that the adversary is coming after Raymond James and after financial services and after your information uh, is because your information is, is valuable, right? This slide honestly probably hasn't been updated in, in four to six months, um, but I guarantee you I could go out to the internet today uh, and pull down articles from within the last week and fill this page with things that are going on, uh, breaches, hacks all over the world uh, that are happening, no kidding, on a day-to-day -day basis. You really can't uh, tune into the evening news or go to your favorite news article website uh, and, and not see something related to cybersecurity and the threat that's out there. There are absolutely unprecedented levels of cybersecurity activity going on. So uh, while a lot of the news is, is intended to scare you and they exaggerate facts and all that type of stuff, uh, when they say that there's a lot of this stuff going on, they're not lying, right? So at, at Raymond James, we see this stuff all day long. I'm going to talk about our security strategy just so I don't get too uh, concerned at this point. But it is happening all day, every day, whether you see it or not, it's going on. Clients, right, you guys want easy to do business with. 
but you also want guarantees of security. At a very high level, when you're talking about adding some sort of functionality, and you see on the slide here, we talk about uh, cloud capability or mobile capability, right? So everybody wants access to all of their data, all of their information, all of their resources from your phone. Um, again, at a very high level, when you're talking about adding functionality, there is security implications and maybe security trade-offs uh, to enable that functionality, which is really why the Information Security Department at Raymond James even exists, right? We've got to balance that trade-off to ensure that we're giving you, the clients, uh, and Randy and his team, the, the resources that they need and the capabilities that they need while also ensuring uh, the security and privacy of that information. So it's, it's a very tough challenge. Um, and that's something that we address uh, head on on a day to day basis. Uh, I mentioned cloud and, and mobile. Cloud is no longer, you know, five years ago, everybody talked about cloud and they said, well, stay away from the cloud. It's, it's too scary. It's too dangerous. That's no longer the case. Um, the security controls that, that come inherent to cloud infrastructure now are uh, becoming equivalent to the, the legacy type of setup. So, so cloud is absolutely fundamental to business. Uh, at Raymond James, we are not shying away from the cloud. We're, we're investigating opportunities to move to the cloud, and that's simply because uh, we trust in our, in, in our ability to apply security to the cloud, uh, and the functionality that that brings uh, is, is something that clients and, and, and the business is asking for. <laughs> Organized crime. Uh, so organized crime is, is more organized than ever, and guess what, now they're online, right? So these are multinational conglomerates that uh, have their drug trafficking division, they've got their human trafficking division, uh, and now they've got their cybercrime division. Uh, and they're dumping a lot of money and a lot of resources into the cybercrime division because guess what? Uh, there's a lot of money coming out of it on the other end. Uh, cyber espionage. Uh, anytime this, this happens, it tends to make the front line uh, you know, e evening news. Uh, while it is out there and we're aware of it, we've got a lot of um, uh, intelligence analysts in our, in our cyber threat center that are addressing these things. Uh, Raymond James is generally not seeing that type of stuff. You're really thinking about nation state level activity when you get into the cyber espionage uh, arena. Any questions so far? Have I scared everybody? Yes, sir. Within Raymond James? Yeah, so, so most organizations. Yeah, so, so his question was, what happens when the communication lines go down? Uh, most organizations, including Raymond James, uh, spend a lot of time and money uh, developing what we call business continuity plans. Uh, and that is essentially if some sort of major catastrophic event happens uh, where our uh, standard communication lines go down, we've got entire contingency plans uh, physical data centers that sit separate from our primary data center. We've got teams that are on standby to address those situations. So that really comes down to planning. And I'm actually going to talk about uh, planning a little bit in, in the information security world in a, in a couple slides. So good question. So anybody hear of them in the news lately? Equifax? No? Should I just skip over this one? Um, what's interesting is, is, you know, I've been presenting on the Equifax breach for probably the last uh, four or five months, um, and it kind of highlights the pace of how quickly things are happening because people are already starting to not care about this anymore. Nobody's talking about it anymore. It's, it's really so recent, but, but because of all the other things that have happened since, uh, people have really moved on. And, and in case you forgot, 145 million Americans' uh, personal data was uh, in scope for this breach, right? So, so exfiltrated out to either Russia or China, um, your, your driver's license numbers, your social security numbers, uh, your home address, pretty much any information that you thought uh, and, and wanted to keep private uh, is no longer private. Um, the reason I, I, it, this particular breach was so painful, especially to the information security world, uh, is because it's really a failure uh, of what most organizations consider very basic information security 101 type of activity, right? And, and I'm not going to get too much in the detail, but just understand uh, that when I talk about our information security strategy at Raymond James, and I mentioned our chief information security officer uh, is a Marine. So when he was developing our strategy, like most Marines, he had to keep things very simple. Uh, and, and just remember that when I get to our strategy, because what we focus on at Raymond James 
uh, is execution, right? So you can have this very in-depth, uh, very pretty strategy that, that oohs and ahs everybody that sees it. Uh, and then like Equifax, you're not actually executing on the things that you say that you're executing on. What we focus on at Raymond James is let's execute the basics. Uh, anything left over, we're going to go further down the line and be looking ahead uh, at what's next and what's coming down uh, the pike. So again, uh, what I always tell clients is Equifax put up a website that you can go and, and determine if your data was in scope of this particular breach. breach. Has anybody done that? If you haven't, uh, I, I don't think there's, there's much value in doing it if you haven't at this point. Assume your data was in scope of this breach because guess what? If your data was not in scope for this breach, it's going to be in scope for the next one, right? We, we put our data out on the internet so much and so often, right? Signing up for Spotify or Facebook or whatever the case is. Oftentimes, we don't even ask the question even to ourselves, where is this data actually going to reside? If you're operating uh, with the assumption that your data is already out there and you're doing the things that you need to do to protect yourself, you're one step ahead of the person that thinks that their data is still private. Any questions on Equifax? Yes, sir. Uh, don't the places like Equifax have some uh, fiduciary responsibility? Um, I, I don't believe they fall under the fiduciary uh, rule. Obviously, they, there is data privacy regulations, and, and there's been a lot of fallout from this specific incident. Uh, their chief security officer and their chief information officer uh, have since, uh, I believe, retired or resigned. However, they worded it, I'm not sure. Um, and I'm sure they had their golden parachute as well. But uh, there has been fallout, and I believe there is actually a class action lawsuit or something in the works. Um, but, but I'm not sure they fall under the same fiduciary type of responsibility as, as a broker-dealer would. Yes, sir. Yeah, do you think because of this privacy violation that things like GDPR will be coming to the U.S. to help address some of this? Yeah, very good question. So GDPR is, is the U.K.'s and the E.U.'s new uh, privacy regulation that actually has some implications to Raymond James. That's a very good question. Um, do I see some of those controls being applied to U.S. at some point? It's likely. Uh, I think uh, we're still kind of in a wait and see on, on what GDPR actually means as far as the uh, no kidding day-to-day -day implications. And I think how smoothly that goes might, um, uh, might influence how quickly something like that might, might pop up in the United States. One thing, one thing, one thing that I think is important to understand, people may have been affected that aren't on the Internet. And we have people say, well, I don't shop online. I don't do this. I don't do that. Your data is still probably with Equifax. <clears throat> if you've ever bought a car or bought a house, if you never go online, you don't have a computer, you can still be impacted by this. So it still applies um, even if you're not shopping and doing those sorts of things. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. Good question. Okay, um, and, and now we're really dating ourselves all the way back to uh, the political campaigns back in 2016. Uh, does anybody remember the name John Podesta? Uh, he was Hillary's campaign manager, campaign advisor. Um, and, and what's interesting about this slide here uh, is this is an actual screenshot from his personal Gmail account uh, of an email that he got sent one morning in 2016. Uh, he opened that email, and, and if you can't see in the back, I'll read a little bit to you. It says, hi, John. Uh, someone just used your password to try to sign into a Google account, his personal john.podesta at gmail.com. Uh, it says, you know, essentially, don't worry about it. We stopped the sign-in attempt because it looked malicious. It didn't look like it was you. Uh, but we do recommend that you go ahead and change your password to your Gmail account, right? Because it looks like somebody might be trying to guess it, so just go ahead and change it. It's got another link there. It says change password. Uh, this looks pretty good, right? Looks. We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> um, so he clicks on the link that says change password, right? And it pops up. We've probably all seen this before. It pops up another uh, little window that says insert your old password. Uh, and right below that, it says insert your new password, right? So again, we've probably seen this uh, in some capacity at some point. As he's typing in his old password, which is his current password, right? Um, you know, 4,000 miles away, whatever it is, in Eastern Europe somewhere in, in Russia, um, to be exact, uh, there's a group that's backed by the Russian government called Fancy Bear. That's just their hacking name. I don't know where they came up with it. So as he's typing in his old password, they're essentially just reading on their screen what his password is. When he types in what he thinks is going to be his new password, 
and clicks confirm, nothing actually happens and his password was never changed. All he did is essentially hand over his password uh, to the Russians. At that point, obviously, they log in and, and we now have Trump as president, so, you, you know, it is what it is. Um, so, one of the things, that I, I'm going to say now, the, the one piece of kind of personal protective measure uh, that if you remember one thing from my presentation today, it's going to be this. Um, actually, I'll give the opportunity to the crowd to see if anybody can come up with this. So, if there was a control that he could have had enabled on his Gmail account, right, a security control, does anybody know what might have prevented this from happening? Yes. Multi-factor. There you go. Multi-factor authentication, also referred to as two-factor authentication. They're interchangeable. Um, Multi-factor authentication, what that is, is essentially your username, right, and your password, the traditional type of authentication or access method, plus another separate factor. Uh, the majority of times today, that is a text message or a pin sent to your personal mobile device when you go to log into something and then you have to put in also that pin that comes to your phone through a text. Yes, ma'am. Do you have to have a smartphone for that text message? Very good question and I didn't, I didn't give her that question beforehand, but you do not. So there are options out there where you can actually get a phone call to even a landline uh, that will then verbally read out the pin that you're required to put into the website. So there are plenty of options out there. Yes, sir. That's a very good question, and I'm going to talk to that in a couple slides. Um, to answer it in a, in a, in a short word, we are, um, and I'll talk to uh, that in a couple slides on, on how you can enable that. Um, so again, multi-factor authentication, the number one takeaway from today. Uh, if he had multi-factor authentication enabled for his Gmail account, which existed then, it exists today, what this would have looked like, he could have clicked on that link, he could have put in his old password, the fancy bears in Russia could have known his password. When they went to log into his Gmail account, they would have been asked to put in a PIN that they would never receive, right? He would have gotten the PIN to his phone. He would have said, I, I never tried to log in. That looks fishy. And then at that point, he could contact uh, Google or Gmail and, and change his password, whatever it is that he wanted to do. But they never would have gotten access to his personal Gmail account. Okay. Um, far and above... Kind of the number one thing and threat that we see at Raymond James comes down to money movement fraud. So you think of wire fraud, you think of ACH fraud. Uh, those are really on a day-to-day -day basis kind of the number one things uh, that we are, are dealing with on the client side. There's a lot of other things that we're dealing with on the information security side, but, but when it comes to impact to clients, this is really the number one thing that we, uh, that we see. I'm going to talk a little bit about some details here in a minute. We've got some other interesting use cases that uh, obviously our intelligence team that I, that I mentioned are, are keeping their eyes on. Um, and, and if you want to have a conversation afterwards, we've got some pretty cool stories to talk about. But, but for today's presentation, I want to talk about uh, wire or, or money movement fraud. Uh, in a running 12-month span between May uh, of 2016 to May of 2017, there were about uh, $8 million worth of wire fraud uh, transactions that were attempted. Uh, right, so we've got a lot of controls in place uh, to prevent a lot of that from happening. Uh, however, once that money leaves Raymond James, uh, so the wire fraud was, uh, the wire transaction was approved, it was initiated, that money left Raymond James. Uh, we have about a 40 to 50% success rate on getting that money back. Um, and that's due to a lot of different factors, right? How quickly we can get engaged. Uh, how quickly the FBI gets engaged because we do rely on the FBI for some matters in, in wire fraud uh, activities. How good the adversary is, right? How quickly that money is once it leaves Raymond James, how quickly is it bouncing around to other organizations and how quickly is it off the radar, right? So just know that when the money leaves in, in a wire fraud attempt, it's about a 50% chance that, that you're going to see those funds again. Luckily for you, uh, in your pamphlets, there is a cybersecurity packet as well, and it talks about the Raymond James cybersecurity promise. Um, the Raymond James cybersecurity promise, and there are no other broker dealers that have a similar type of cybersecurity promise. That essentially says that if you have some sort of financial impact due to no fault of your own, right? So this doesn't cover a bad investment. Uh, it doesn't cover you giving out your password to your investor access account to your brother and he doesn't like you because you used to beat him up or whatever and he transfers all of his money out. Um, if, if you have a wire fraud 
transaction initiated against you, right? Because the adversary broke into your account or they compromised your email, Raymond James is going to make you whole, right? And that is our cybersecurity promise. There is no fine print. Uh, there are no asterisks. Um, if it is a cybersecurity issue and you have a financial uh, impact due to that, Raymond James will make you whole. There's no caps on that. Uh, and again, that is the only uh, firm that has that level of cybersecurity promise uh, inherent to their organization. By the way, most of the time, a wire fraud uh, attempt or transaction uh, looks something like this, right? A client gets their email account compromised. Maybe they're not using multi-factor authentication. So go turn on multi-factor authentication. The adversary is getting very good at what they do. So it's no longer an email uh, that says, you know, they're the king of, of uh, you know, Cameroon and Africa and your great, great, great uncle died and you're now gonna inherit a gazillion dollars. All you need to do is put a retainer down of $1,000 and you'll get the money later. They're not doing that anymore, right? They're very good at what they do. They will get access to your personal Gmail account, for example. They will look for a conversation that you may have had between uh, Randy and yourself concerning whatever it is. They will inject themselves into that conversation. They'll even kind of learn how you construct an email, how you sign your name, all these different things. And they will send uh, Randy an email saying, hey, this is so-and-so, uh, I need a wire, uh, a wire transfer of $9,999. Uh, I need it sent to this account and I need you to do this immediately. Don't call me, uh, I'm in a funeral or I'm on a plane. Uh, any excuse so that Randy's not gonna try to pick up the phone uh, and give them a call to, to verify they're trying to send this money out. So obviously there's a lot of controls that Randy has at his organization to ensure that they're gonna talk to you before they initiate any sort of wire transfer like that. So when you're trying to get frustrated that they're uh, trying to contact you before they initiate this transfer, just keep in mind that is the number one thing that we see uh, successful wire fraud attempts uh, is exactly in that manner. So when he contacts you to verify that, that is, that is to keep these things from happening. Any questions on wire fraud? Yes, sir. What about uh, transfers within your bank from one account to another? Yeah, so they would have to have actual access to uh, your account, first of all. Uh, and secondly, if they're just transferring it from, they wouldn't do that, right? They would try to get the money out of your account before they just transfer it within your your personal accounts. Uh, I don't believe you actually have to have a phone call or conversation to transfer within accounts. In our office. We okay, so you do, at, at Randy's office, you do have to have a conversation to, to initiate that transfer as well. Standing authorization. And, and authorization as well. <coughs> the, other, well the other question was this. Transferring something from my account to the sales of Raymond James into my bank account. So, so, so you're talking about transferring from your Raymond James account to an external bank account. Um, there's, there's not much threat there, uh, just being honest, simply because that's going from your account to your bank account. So you can actually monitor that transaction and make sure that your uh, money shows up on the other end. What we're concerned about is, is the money leaving your Raymond James account, right, and going to account that is outside of our control. Uh, and, and once it hits that account, guess what? They move it to another account. And, and once it starts to get more and more hops, uh, it's, it's harder and harder to keep track of and ultimately try to try to recoup those funds. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, what if the victim is cooperating with them and, and you, you've gotten a, a text message, your grandson is in trouble and needs money, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and uh, it's what a fraud. Yeah, so uh, is your question, uh, basically he's asking if, if the victim is cooperating with the fraudster, uh, basically enabling them to kick off the wire transfer funds or whatever the case is. Uh, and, and your question is, is that covered by our cybersecurity promise? How, how do you protect yourself from that? Yeah, so is, is the easiest way, yes, it is covered. I'll answer that first, right? So that is covered by our cybersecurity promise. Uh, the easiest way to deal with these type of things, right, is to make sure that you are 100% confident in the communications that you're having, right? So understand that email obviously is, is the number one attack vector and it can be compromised. So uh, if you're getting emails from a source that you normally don't get emails from, uh, if there's a discussion from a source that you normally don't have a, a discussion about, guess what? Pick up the phone, have the conversation, try to understand 100% uh, certainty that that is the person that you're actually communicating with. So by, by far, 
uh, the easiest way to, to defeat these fraudsters is to pick up the phone and have a conversation. Good question. Yes, sir. Generally, within 24 hours, mm -hmm. the money is there and it's available. How valid is it to, to sit on that for a week? Yeah, so an interesting stat here, which you guys might not be able to see the details here. Uh, we actually break it out by wire transfer and ACH. Um, ACH, as far as the attempts and the successful fraud activity via ACH, is much lower than wire, right? And that's because of that holding mechanism that they have in place. Um, the reason that they do that is because they're validating what's actually going on on the back end. So wire transfer, because it's so readily available and there, uh, that is primarily what the adversary focuses on because it's very quickly and, and they can move that very quickly uh, from account to account. So ACH, uh, at least by the numbers, is actually a more secure way to do it. Uh, I, I don't know if it's uh, technically it doesn't take a week. It's up to the firm. It's yeah, it, it, it's, it's it's policy up by each de, uh, independent firm. Okay, so I mentioned our information security strategy again. Uh, Andy Zulper, uh, uh, former Marine or or, or Marine officer, uh, came up with our strategy. Kept it very simple, uh, and like I said previously, we focus very heavily on execution. There's really four pillars here, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each one. So protect, right, is, is really the traditional building a castle, right, around the Raymond James environment, around... Oh, I think I might have... Did I lose... Sorry. Can you still hear me? There you go. Does that one work? There you go. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm back. Um, <laughs> So protect is really the traditional building a fortress around Raymond James environment. Uh, it's building a fortress around, I keep losing it. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. My trusted sidekick here. Um, and, and building that fortress around your data, right? So you, you, I'm sure everybody's heard of the term firewall before. Uh, we've got layered security at the perimeter. So any adversary trying to get into the Raymond James environment has to go through multiple layers of security. Uh, it's called layer, layered security. You don't want to have a single point of failure uh, with access into your environment. So if, if one control does fail, uh, we know at Raymond James, right, that we have several controls sitting behind that uh, to ensure that the adversary cannot walk through the door at that point. So, uh, protect is really the traditional security aspect of building that infrastructure to uh, that that technology infrastructure to secure uh, the environment. Detect over the last five years has really become uh, the name of the game in, in cybersecurity, and, and detect uh, is is really about recognizing and responding when something does go bad. Right, breaches happen. Uh, you can have the best security in the world. Uh, and at some point, something is going to go wrong. That's just kind of the nature of the business. It's the nature of technology. Every organization understands that, and we prepare for that, right? And that's the detect piece. I'm gonna talk about our cyber threat center here in a couple slides. And our cyber threat center, you know, as, a, as an Air Force guy, um, the cyber thre threat center guys, they're really like the fighter pilots of Raymond James Information Security. They're the cool guys, right? They're the young, uh, young gunners that are, that are hands-on keyboards, eyes on glass, 24 by seven, 365, monitoring what's going on, not only exterior to our environment, but also interior, right? We wanna be constantly looking for, does the adversary exist within our network? Uh, if it does, we wanna to respond to it, we wanna contain, contain it, and we wanna eradicate it. So I'm gonna talk about our cyber threat center here in a second. Develop, uh, as I mentioned previously, we spend a lot of time and money developing our resources. Um, we make sure that all of our information security professionals have uh, industry leading certifications, industry leading uh, uh, training to make sure that we're keeping up and staying one head a uh, step ahead of the adversary. Uh, and lastly, partner. Uh, partner, we partner with uh, 
technology vendors, right? So one of our firewall uh, vendors is called Palo Alto Networks. Um, today, right, my boss has the CEO of Palo Alto Networks uh, basically on speed dial. Uh, and, and that's simply because we've spent a lot of time developing a relationship with these technology vendors uh, so that if we have a unique scenario that we want them to help us address, uh, they're one phone call away and they're going to work with us to make sure that we're getting what we need uh, out of them. We also partner with Raymond James Business. And that's why I'm here today, obviously. From an information security perspective, if I don't understand how the business operates, right, and I don't understand what clients do and how they interact with their FAs and how they interact with uh, the websites, right, I'm not going to be able to recognize what isn't normal, right? So I want to know what normal behavior is within the business so that we can key on what might not be normal, right? Because what might not be normal might be something malicious, right? So that's the, uh, the, the partner piece. Any questions on the information security strategy? Okay, these are not stock picks, so don't go home and start investing in these. Um, much like a financial advisor, right, we manage our technology portfolio uh, in, in a similar manner, right? So we've got a mix of tried and true best of breed technologies. You think of Palo Alto Networks, uh, you think of RSA, you think of Splunk. But we also want to mix in some, some startups that might be addressing some more specific type of threats or, or specific type of concerns. Uh, and no kidding, on a monthly basis, uh, we have a conversation within our organization and we talk about uh, which vendors are performing, not in the markets, right? Which one are, are performing for us, which ones aren't. And we move vendors in and out based on their performance, right? So we hold them accountable uh, to deliver what it is that we expect them to deliver. I wanna quickly go over a couple of tools that we're using simply because they're, they're kind of bleeding edge type of technologies. Uh, Silence is a anti-malware or anti-virus type of functionality. It sits on your computer and makes sure that nothing malicious or funky is going on on your computer. This tool is not even available to the consumer market yet. Uh, it's using artificial intelligence, it's using machine learning to essentially stop things that are bad uh, before we even recognize them as being bad. So very cool technology, uh, kind of bleeding edge type of thing that we now have deployed within the Raymond James environment. Proofpoint does our email security. Uh, I mentioned previously that email is the number one attack vector uh, for the adversary, right? Uh, Proofpoint, uh, anything that comes into the Raymond James environment that either has an attachment, right, like a Word document, or it has a link to some sort of website. Those are two ways that the adversary gets the, uh, the end victim to uh, infect themselves. They either open an attachment that they don't trust, or they click on a link that they don't recognize, right? Anything that comes into the Raymond James environment is scanned multiple times before it even gets to the end user's inbox, right? We've got so many controls within Proofpoint that no kidding, at the end of the day, right, only 28% of emails that are sent to Raymond James actually get delivered. Uh, the rest, right, 78% of those uh, are actually dumped by Proofpoint, right? They're malicious, it's spam, whatever the case is, only 28% of emails actually make it to Raymond James at the end of the day. I mentioned our Cyber Threat Center. Again, when, you know, I'm a young guy, but when I walk into the Cyber Threat Center, um, I feel old, right? These guys are no kidding, uh, 24, 25, 26 years old, and they've been doing this for 10 years, right? So they're starting young. Uh, it's a very cool, interesting field to be in. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's about 50,000 events per second within Raymond James environment. So an event is like a send of an email, a click of a link, those are events. 50,000 per second, right? I don't care how big your, your team of humans are, nobody can really comprehend and analyze that amount of information uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. We rely a, a lot on technology. I, I mentioned our, our vendor portfolio a couple of slides ago. That technology essentially isolates down, no kidding, the, the events that might be malicious in nature, right? And at that point, uh, we use our, our true value, and that is the human capital aspect of our cyber threat center, uh, to go and investigate what's actually going on in that specific event. Any questions on our Cyber Threat Center? Jason? Yes, sir. Of the 72% uh, of emails and stuff that's sorted, 
now, how much of that is stuff that you wish had gotten through? That's a good question. So what you're, he's basically asking of all the emails that don't make it to the end user, how many did you actually want to make it to the end user? Uh, that's called a false positive rate, meaning how often do we say something was bad that isn't actually bad? Uh, it's under 1%. So under one, it does happen from time to time, obviously, uh, but it's under 1% as far as we trashed an email that we actually wanted to get delivered. Very good question. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the best uh, filter for home email today? Yeah, so Proofpoint actually uh, it has a consumer uh, version. Uh, obviously, that's a, that's a very good tool. Um, there's a lot of native email filtering functionality within Gmail, within Yahoo. For the majority of, of individual consumer users, the native technology is probably the best way to go. And here's why, because you're not gonna have to manage it, right? Any tool that you deploy for yourself, uh, it takes effort to manage and, and upkeep that tool. Uh, honestly, for, for us as individuals, it's, it's best to use the native functionality because they're, they're doing the right thing, especially Gmail and Yahoo and the, and the bigger uh, email providers. Sure. Yeah, there, there are false positives. It's, it's the nature of technology. Um, it, just know that on the back end, there's teams that, that are constantly trying to manage that and tweak the configurations to ensure that that's kept at an acceptable rate. Who in here has, yes, sir? Do you, do you guys use any Linux-based systems? Yes, we use a lot of Linux. Uh, we use a lot of Windows OS as well. We've got a healthy mix of both, depending on the functionality of, of what's actually writing on that infrastructure. Uh, we, we use anything from uh, 2008 R2 all the way up to 2015. So we've got basically uh, all of it. Obviously, we try to stay as current as possible. Good question. Who here in, uh, has an investor access account? That's the online portal so you can log in and see your portfolio. Okay, a lot of hands. Uh, keep your hands up for one second. Who here has multi-factor authentication turned on on that investor access account? Oh, that, that's, uh, that's a good amount of hands, though. Um, yes, sir? Can you clarify multi-factor identification? Yeah. Does that include the second question where, you know, what was your home address? That does not. So that's a very good question. So the, the security questions are not considered multi-factor authentication. Guess what? Because those can be guessed, right? Uh, somebody can look. If they already have your personal information, they can look up where what address you lived at in 1995, right? So. Those are called enhanced authentication, so it helps, but it's not two-factor or multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is available in investor access today. Uh, it's very easy to turn on. Actually, Randy can turn it on for you, or somebody that works at his branch can turn it on for you. Um, it can actually, like I said, call a landline and read the number to you as you type it into the investor access account so that you can get access. Uh, I highly recommend uh, today going and enabling that if you don't have it enabled today. Yes, sir. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of things that could happen. Um, it's not happening in mass today, right? So the number one easiest way to secure your, your information and your data and your accounts is multi-factor authentication. That may change in five years. There might be something else that we need to do, uh, but today that's the most effective way to do it. Is uh, Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator? Great, great solutions, absolutely. Google Authenticator is one of the most popular out there. Uh, great option for you, but but luckily for investor access, we have a native solution within the app. Uh, all you have to do is is opt into it. So there's really no benefit to those not 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 using it for investor access. We've got the native solution that we manage as well. Okay, uh, Client Vault. Uh, Client Vault is available within investor access. It's a secure way for you to share documents back and forth between yourself uh, and the branch. Um, try to get away from sending documents through email. Uh, this is a secure method that we've kind of built and built uh, Raymond James security around. Uh, so you know that when you upload a document or, or you receive a document through the client vault, uh, it's done so in a secure fashion. 
personal protective measures. So these are the things that you want to take back to your personal lives and make sure that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, because at the end of the day, the clients and individuals, including myself, are really the most vulnerable, right? The adversary can either spend a lot of time and money uh, trying to bypass our uh, security program, right, that we spend a lot of time and money building, or guess what? He can send the client an individual email uh, and hope that you click on a link or open an attachment that you don't trust, right? And at that point, they have access to your PC uh, and they go from there. Two-factor authentication, everything. Uh, there's a website here, I highly re recommend uh, writing it down. It's called turnon2fa.com. It will actually walk you through a tutorial, tutorial on how to enable two-factor authentication for basically every application out there, Facebook, Twitter, all the banking accounts, all your personal Gmail or, or uh, personal email accounts. They all support this, but it requires you to actually go in and turn that on. Um, secure your competing devices. Make sure that your antivirus, right, and your local firewall, we all see pop-ups all the time. Make sure that you have automatic updates turned on because if you're relying on yourself to go in and make sure that you update this tool on a daily or weekly basis, you're already behind the power curve. These vendors re release updates basically every day to make sure that they're staying current. You gotta turn that stuff on. Um, have a strong password that can't be guessed. Obviously, first of all, use two-factor authentication uh, and don't reuse passwords. The first thing that the adversary does when they get a password that works, they use that same password on every other application that you use, right? Because what we all do, we come up with a very good password that nobody's ever gonna guess. Uh, and then we use it on everything that we do, right? I'm sure people in here do it. I used to do it, to be honest, when I was a kid. It's not a good way to do things. Uh, there are password managers, right, that essentially securely store your passwords for you. Uh, there's a couple listed here that we recommend, um, and it will ensure that your, your passwords are secure and you can keep individual passwords for each account that you manage. Yes? You're recommending LastPass, and yet that's probably the most vulnerable of the passwords. So there, there uh, about a week and a half ago, there was a Android-driven uh, um, uh, um, vulnerability within LastPass. Yes. Uh, my team takes a look at LastPass on a yearly basis, and, and what we really are looking for uh, is the security program to ensure that those things are addressed. I mentioned previously, bad things happen, right? We, we understand that vulnerabilities are gonna be found, uh, we're confident in LastPass's ability to address those vulnerabilities and make sure that they're keeping uh, pace with the environment. Have you looked at RoboForm? Uh, I have not, not specifically RoboForm. There's a lot of tools out there, a lot of good ones uh, outside of this list. These are just two that we've taken a look at and personally uh, think are doing the right things on the security side. Back up your data. Um, it, make sure that you have a valid and recent backup of the information that you care about, whether it's the small business that you run, uh, whether it's pictures of your grandkids or your nieces or nephews, whatever the case is, uh, anything that you care about, make sure that you have a backup plan in place. And guess what? If you're backing up uh, data to a USB drive that's connected to your computer, that's not a real backup, right? Because if something happens on that computer, it's gonna happen to that connected drive, right? So if you're doing that, back it up, disconnect it, and put it away, right? So just make sure that you have a backup because at the end of the day, if something does go wrong and you have a recent backup, you can get that information back and you can keep moving forward. Do you recommend any of the online trickle backups like Carbonite? Or so Carbonite is exactly the one that, that we generally recommend. It's a cloud-based uh, backup solution, very good. There's a lot of different options uh, for individual use. Uh, so Carbonite would be one that we uh, definitely recommend. If you're, if you're using the cloud as your main storage area and not keeping that much stuff on the computer, that's already backed up, right? Uh, absolutely. So there's a lot of cloud backup solutions that essentially if you store it there, it's doing backups for you. Uh, very good option as well. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, very good question, and, and obviously you're, you're uh, keeping up to speed with what's going on in the news. So uh, there were two vulnerabilities called Meltdown Inspector uh, that were recently discovered and released, essentially that impact basically every computing chip that exists today. Uh, and the bad part is a lot of the 
uh, vendors or providers are already coming out with updates and patches to fix it, uh, but there's impact to the performance of whatever it is that you're fixing. So essentially what you're, you're stuck in now is I've got vulnerabilities that exist on my computer, and if I fix them, then now my computer is going to run slower. Um, honestly, it's very, it's very early. Um, we've applied the patch within Raymond James, and to be honest, at this point, we're dealing with the uh, performance impact and understanding how we approach this going forward. But really, it's too early to tell, no kidding, uh, obviously, the impact and what the end, end solution is going to be. Good question. They haven't seen anyone take advantage of it. Not yet. So, so that's another good point. Nobody's actually executed on those vulnerabilities at this point yet. It might only be a matter of time, but, but it's still too early to kind of see uh, what the end goal is going to be. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, sorry, I, I want to keep this uh, presentation moving, but I'll be around uh, for a little bit after the presentations. Um, so catch me if you have a question, we can talk. Uh, otherwise, thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Okay. I know we're going through a lot. We just need 10 more minutes of your time, so we just hang tight. We're going to do this. we got a couple of important things. Um, one of the resources we have is access to the Raymond James Bank, and they provide a number of lending solutions that people may not be aware of. Uh, the representative from the Raymond James Bank with us is Dino Martin Bianco. Um, maybe take three minutes, kind of run through this stuff, because there's two solutions that we're seeing a lot of people using, so they don't have to liquidate investments. And then I want to wrap up, I promise, 10 minutes or less, um, with some of the stuff that's coming up. So, quick intro. Thanks, Randy. We'll, uh, we'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, just kind of give you a little history of the bank. Um, uh, it's a good sized bank. I was talking to a couple other folks out there. Uh, we're, we're a large enough bank to where we can get things done, but we're a small enough bank to where we don't forget who we're working for, and that's you out there in the marketplace. Um, just to kind of go through, uh, uh, a couple of slides that I have, um, just to give you a little history of the bank. So we started off with a margin product, uh, basically an overdraft from an investment perspective. We got into the mortgage uh, industry um, uh, several years ago. Um, that, I'll be honest, we, we, when we first started we weren't very good. Um, we, we have accomplished a lot since then. We brought banking consultants like, like myself uh, boots on the ground to kind of shepherd the process uh, from application uh, through closing and servicing um, and uh, have accomplished quite a bit. Yeah, the, the previous slide there was... I can't go back. Okay. Got it, got it. Thank you. Um, and then we added the security baseline and credit, which, which we'll touch on uh, here shortly, uh, and then brought in cash solutions products, which would be um, your uh, capital access product with remote access, remote deposit, uh, cash sweeps products, which allows for uh, CIPIC and excess CIPIC insurance up to $2.5 million uh, versus a regular FDIC insured uh, account that you'd see at a, at a normal bank of $250,000, and then uh, credit card products and services that we brought in uh, to provide additional uh, alternatives for clients. Really quick, we'll talk about the uh, security baselines of credit. Uh, uh, excellent product, lots of uses for these. Uh, we see this more and more uh, on a daily basis. Life-changing events, whether it's a divorce or marriage, um, doing remodelings to homes. Um, it's a simplified process. Uh, buying a new home, uh, college education, whether it's a grandparent for a grandchild or a parent uh, that hadn't set money aside for the uh, 529 plans natural disasters, uh, business working capital, luxury items. Hell, you could even buy a salt truck uh, on your way in today if you wanted to. The uh, one example I had was a, a gentleman that I worked with uh, doing a commercial loan, really going through the, the grind of a commercial uh, process, commercial loan process, high fees, uh, environmental testing, appraisals, closing costs, high interest rates, and we were able to put together uh, assets that were uh, titled in a trust, joint, uh, individual, and LLC assets, put those together and, and get him a $2.5 million loan for his business expansion. And do all, doing all that at zero cost 
and allowing for an interest rate that was just under two percent lower than what he's being offered on the commercial side so a lot of lot of uses for it a great product uh, definitely something that being proactive and having it in place is good uh, for you and, and, and uh, it, it helps in the, for future uh, funding and, and distributions um, next slide mortgages really quick just to jump through these um, Everybody knows that, that uh, mortgages are available out there, whether it's a new home purchase, refinances. We do it in all 50 states. So we cover um, the, the full gamut, uh, whether it's a primary residence, second home, or a non-owner occupied investment property. One thing we do have is a, is a comprehensive menu in terms of our underwriting and special programs um, one, to, uh, as an example, is the Asset Performa program where we can take your relationship with Randy and the Carver team and use that as paper income to supplement the income that's already being provided. A lot of folks that have, uh, that are, let's say, retired, uh, might have uh, retirement income through Social Security, through pension, and they're limited, but they want to go out, let's say, and buy a second home and they still have their primary residence out there. Well, based on their non-qualified assets or potentially qualified assets with us, uh, we can establish additional income to uh, use for approval. Just one example. The well, one, uh, last one I want to bring up is the Pledge Security Mortgage Program. Now, this was an option that we put in place because clients we, we noticed were buying homes with security based lines of credit and security based lines of credit are it's a great tool great product but it's also based on 30-day LIBOR so we're seeing interest rate increases what this does is allows the client to lock into a mortgage rate so whether it's a five-year seven-year ten-year or 30-year fixed rate finance up to 100% of the purchase of the home or refinance if up to the value of the home if that's the case not pay any private mortgage insurance. You can do the, uh, like we said, the fixed rate or the arm rates and, and avoid potential capital gains by not uh, uh, liquidating any investments and not pay any private mortgage insurance. So those are two of the important uh, items there. One of the uh, solutions that we use this uh, Pledge Security Mortgage for are parents pledging for children. It's called a, a family pledge. And we had the ability to, uh, let's say the, 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 the youngster is buying a you know, $400,000 house and doesn't quite have the down payment. Well, the parent can, instead of pulling money out of the investment account, can pledge their assets or a certain set of a amount of assets on behalf of that lack of liquidation and, and lack of uh, investment. Finally, again, just to, uh, just to touch base on this, um, we've got a the gentleman that we're working with right now as an example uh, that is buying a, a home um, prior to selling his current home and wants to finance up to 100% of that house. Well, that's what this private mortgage insurance or private mortgage, private security mortgage, excuse me, uh, product does. Again, I, I want to uh, cut it short and sweet here today. I encourage you to talk to Randy and his advisors about any of your specific needs. If there's anything that I can help out with, either today uh, uh, afterwards or uh, down the road, if you have any questions uh, or have a specific uh, uh, circumstance, I'd be glad to help out and the uh, advisors can bring me on board. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming out here today. Okay, last thing. I wanna thank you guys for coming. Um, stuff that's coming up, April 17th, we have Brian Westbury coming back. Some of you guys heard him a few years ago. So the chief economist from First Trust. You see him on CNBC. A lot of people watch his blog. Um, awesome, awesome person. Give a view of the economy. We have a transition to retirement town hall. And then we have our golf event. And then to announce the trip for 2019, uh, we're gonna do a South Africa trip. Well, it's very limited. We can only take 46 people. Uh, we've got about 20 signed up at this point. Uh, if you want information, email me. The brochures will be going out in about three weeks. I really do expect this to sell out within a week or two of the brochures. So if you have interest, um, let us know. We'll get the info. 
um, and get signed up, but don't uh, diddle daddle because it will fill up. This year's trip, we have 106 going in a couple weeks, and again, we, we sold out, which is great. We started doing these things because um, people worked hard to save their money. They're healthy enough to do it. And in a lot of cases, you know, it's hard to put together a more sophisticated trip. And that's, that's really the criteria that we're using, things that you wouldn't or couldn't do on your own. So I hope you'll look at that. Um, everything's on our website, carpetfinancialservices.com. We update it literally daily, but certainly every week uh, we're adding events and changes. So I'd encourage you to look at that. And with that, um, appreciate you guys. I appreciate Nick Corris and Francisco. Also Ian Roche and Patrick. LeBlanc, I don't know if they're still here, helped uh, support the event. Everyone from our office, and of course, Jason and Dino. So, thank you for coming out.